Hello, good morning, and welcome to our live study today. To be here. As always, it's good if you have any uh, prayer requests, please feel free to share them in the chat. If you have any questions about the study, uh, questions about anything we were talking about in this study series, um, just feel free to also put those in the chat and I will try to get to them or get back to them next week. Um, if you're online with me, please say hello. I love seeing your little, um, the little faces pop up and the comments pop up in the chat stream. So today we are talking about um, Revelation chapters six and seven, the seals and the sealed. I'm very excited about this study. And when you read through it, uh, just on your own. Sometimes it sounds kind of crazy, but when you actually start getting into it, um, it's there's so much good news in here. I, I mean, when you read it on the surface, it doesn't necessarily sound good, but it is full. It's just rich with God's love and grace. So um, we're going to dig into that, and I'll just start with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to um, study together, study online. I pray for anyone tuning in today tuning in now or watching this later i pray that um, you will open their hearts and minds and and mine as well lead this study by your grace and by your wisdom may we see a big a bigger picture of you and um, who we are in you and how much you love us so bless this study with your presence in your name jesus we pray amen all right so here we go we're going to look at revelation chapter 6 um, now, before I dig into all this good news, I want to uh, be faithful to mention that, um, you know, that there is a historical perspective to studying this. Good morning, Linda. Good to see you on here. Um, that's what's taught. It's taught everywhere. In fact, later on, I'm going to put um, a link to a study guide that goes over what we call the historical method of interpretation and that means applying the seals to different time periods this uh, w this was something that came up in the 1800s when they studied this we'll talk a little bit more about that later but um, god led them to see this it, it as uh, time periods so um, i'll just quickly mention what those are and like i said i'll put a link in later if you want to study this more that would be going through the seals. The first seal would be the spread of the gospel from Pentecost. It has that imagery. The second one would be the second century and the start of persecution of Christians, Christianity. Um, the third would be uh, the fourth century when the church becomes a, became a political power and sort of um, maybe relied on its own tradition and its own authority rather than God. Um, the fourth seal is generally interpreted as the Dark Ages. The fifth seal as a picture of the time of the Reformation of, of all the martyrs. And then the sixth seal, what happened in the late 17, early 1800s. So um, I'm not at all contradicting this. I want to let you know that. I'm not, I'm not contradicting the historical way our church and many others, in fact, this is um, it was a, a, during the Great Awakening interdenominational worldwide uh, movement that began interpreting it this way. Um, so I'm not saying that doesn't fit. I agree with that. I've seen it that way. But what I would like to present is that God's word is expansive. And I talked a bit about this before. We can't limit God's word. We should never come to God's word and say, oh, I studied that, that equals this, I'm done with it. There's nothing else for me to learn. God's word grows. We need to come to it as a humble learner every time we approach it. And in that, we will then be opened and moved by his Holy Spirit to see and find more meaning. So what I'm presenting is additional meaning on top of that, that doesn't often get discussed and looked at, and which I think um, has richer value. And I'll tell you why I think it has richer value. And that is because if we study the seals and we just look at them at time periods, then what we have a tendency to do is look at through up through almost to the end of the sixth seal. We don't need to worry about it. 
that all happened in the past. We're, we're basically discounting that whole section of the word of God and saying it has nothing else to tell me except for that it applies to the past. I don't believe that, that we should um, see it that way. I believe it still speaks to us today and has more to say. So um, again, I just want to stress, I'm talking about adding to, not taking from that, but adding to. So let's see who's popped on. Kevin, glad you're on here. Furman, always great to hear from you. Nancy, glad you're with us. Uh, Kevin saying good morning to everybody. Yes, so great to have you on here. All right, so we're going to look at this, how God expands this word. I'm so excited about it because it's so beautiful for us when we, when we look at the expansive image. And, it, and it, makes it, um, it makes it fresh and have meaning right now. So I, I love that. All right, so I want to talk about um, first the, the background imagery. The other thing I love about Revelation is that it's founded on all of the Bible. Uh, and a lot of Hebrew history. John came from the Hebrew culture, so it's full of the Word of God. And we can have better understanding of the rest of the Word of God as we understand Revelation, and better understanding of Revelation as we look at the rest of the Word of God, and it just makes the Bible come more alive. So there's background um, biblical support for this section. Um, one of those or two of those sections would be found in Leviticus 26 and De Deuteronomy 28. Those sections are the time that God gave the, the Israelites what we call the blessings and the curses. And it had to do with covenant faithfulness. If they were faithful to the covenant, they would be blessed. If they were unfaithful, then they would not, they would lose their blessing. The language of the curses is war famine, pestilence, the sword, wild beast, repeated over and over. Every time God allowed a correction for his people, this is the language. And this language we find in the seals. And so when we look at the seals, we see correction. That language tells us that what's happening is correction for lack of covenant faithfulness. And this isn't just the Old Testament covenant. This is now talking about the new covenant that Jesus made. This is out of step with the grace of God, the gospel of God, and the good news of Jesus. So it's a correction for that. So, um, and the, the, another background is in Zechariah. So I'm going to actually turn to Zechariah because you'll see how this ties in. But um, I want to first look at the purpose of corrections because when we hear that, you know, that God would curse his people, it's not, a, it's not terminology we use today about God. But it was always understood that he did this for their protection. It wasn't out of anger. Um, it may be out of jealousy. There's times the Bible says he's a, you know, he's a jealous God because he loves so much. His jealousy works to try and save us back to him. So here's the purpose. And I'm turning to Zechariah. We're going to see how significantly it ties to the seals in a minute. But Zechariah starts off with, with this in verses 2 and 3. The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. So this is talking about them being out of covenant faithfulness. And in verse 3 it says, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Here's the great purpose. And we should never lose sight of this, studying all of Revelation, because all this craziness is going on and stuff is happening. And we're like, who is this God? Doesn't seem to be the same Jesus that I follow, right? But the fact is that all of this is grounded in God's desire to save us. And if he removes his blessing, if he removes his, his covering and his care and his protection, all these bad things happen. But the point of them is to cause us to return. So that is foundational to what we're looking at today. So I said Zechariah is a book of major background toward, for the seals because the four, first four seals are all represented as horses. You see horses. In Zechariah, it's the other place in the Bible where we see these horses. Um, it says in verse 8, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees. 
in the halo and behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. So we're seeing these different colored horses. He asks who they are. In verse 10, uh, the man in the myrtle tree says to him, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. So it's representative of something that God sends out into all the earth. So we see that going on here. I'm going to flip over to, to Zechariah chapter 6, where we see more of these horses and stuff, starting in verse 1. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses, the ch second chariot black horses, the third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses. Okay, so we see the four colored horses, very similar. Um, the only color that's different is dappled, where um, we'll see in the seals that we have a pale horse, which is ashen. But this dappling, it actually means spotted or spotted with hail. So you sort of get that feel of an ashen color dappled on these horses. And then it goes on again, um, Zechariah asked, who are these? And in verse five, the angel answered and said to me, these are four spirits of heaven who go out from their, their station before the Lord of all the earth. And in chapter seven, I mean, verse seven, it says they're told, go walk to and fro throughout the earth. And then in verse eight, um, and it says, and he called me and spoke to me saying, and he capitalized, meaning God, See those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. And uh, my spirit there is capitalized. So it's reference to like the Holy Spirit, God's spirit. So we see these ties going on and these things happening there. And, and we're going to bring this imagery together as we uh, look at, at Revelation. I get so excited about talking about this. I just, it's so fun to me to dig in and have all this beauty just like, it's like digging for treasure. If you take the time to dig and then you find the treasure, then you get the joy, but you have to take the time to dig a little bit. Anyway, so I'm very excited. So here we see the foundation of um, where the background, historical background comes for the first four seals, which are um, tied to four horses. And before we get into looking at each horse, the background to chapter six overall, chapter six of Revelation, we have to remember who is the one opening the seals. We studied in chapter five, it was celebrated, everybody worshiped because Jesus was able to open these seals. Jesus is the one opening them. We can't forget this. Because if we read these, just read through and we feel like it's bad news and we don't understand it, if we forget that Jesus is the one in control, it's easy to get anxious about what we're reading and what this may mean for, you know, end times and what people experience. But Jesus is the one in control. He's opening them. The other thing that we see happening is that with each one that he opens, starting with the first one, I saw and the lamb opened one of the seals. So we see Jesus opening the seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come. Some versions may say come and see, but in the Greek, it's just, they're just saying come. And then John looks and then I looked and behold a white horse. Okay, each of these horses is, is introduced by these living creatures. Remember we talked about these living creatures before the throne and they're all full of eyes. And the imagery that we have in chapters four and five is, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we can't, the Spirit is invisible. So the imagery used to paint the picture of the representation of the Spirit is like these, these crazy creatures full of eyes. And I wanna tell you the tie, how these three tie together. So. God is seen on the throne. He's got seven lampstands that are seven spirits. Then we see his son Jesus, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. So we see the tie and the language that is similar. So it's saying that God the Father has something similar that Jesus the Son, but Jesus has the eyes. Now the eyes tie in to the creatures that have the eyes and they're all in the midst of the throne. 
The next thing we see is that in chapter 4, in the midst of the throne, there were thunderings and voices. When these, these creatures introduced the horses, you see, like this starts with, there was thundering, a voice like thunder. Later on, we'll see a voice that speaks from the midst of the throne. We're getting the impression here that these creatures represent the Holy Spirit sending out the horses. Now remember in Zechariah it says those horses that went to the north, they did their work, and now my spirit has rest there. You see that tie? So this is very exciting. This is a work of God. It's a picture of his omnipresence. Because the four and the four horses, later on we'll see the four corners, this is symbolic of what we say the four corners of the world, right? And we have four directions of the world. It means God's present world presence worldwide. There's this, this sort of um, imagery that represents some omnipresence happening, just like we talked about in the throne room, the eyes, all these eyes, the way that God sees us and is omnipresent, the way that through the Spirit we see Him. The other thing that we saw flashing back to chapter 4 is that these creatures initiate worship. It's God's Holy Spirit that always initiates worship within us and among us. So there's a lot of imagery that ties to this. So we can't forget this foundational start. This is all a movement of God. It's all in God's hands. So what we see happening, we should remember that Jesus said in chapter 1, he started off with, do not be afraid. It's all in his hands. All right, now we get into the seals. So I'm going to look through the, the seals, um, starting with the first one. The first one, we have these imagery. It's a white horse, right? So I'll just read them. They're very short. I looked and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow. A crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. Like I said, historically, this is believed to be the first century church from Pentecost when the gospel first went out. But the imagery that we have here, this white symbolic of righteousness, God's righteousness, being sent out. It tie, does definitely tie to imagery with the gospel. We see a crown, so we see victory, and we also see this bow. The bow's interesting because while, while it's like this symbolic of a, an archer bow, the bow also um, represents God's grace. And the reason why it represents God's grace is because back in Genesis 9.13, when it says after the flood he put his rainbow in the clouds or he put his bow in the clouds that hebrew word actually ties to an archer's bow it mimics the arch now the word in greek is also very beautiful because the the root word where this word bow comes from in greek actually means to bring forth to give birth and the imagery is a is of a woman who's pregnant so um, this could almost even be foreshadowing. Later on, we see a woman who's pregnant. But um, while it's an archer's bow, it has a lot of background and tie to grace. So we see this first horse. We see such good news. This horse is going out into all the earth, right? So all four of them, we see these things going on. And they still exist and are still being spread and going out and doing their work on, in the earth. Now we come to the second one. The second one, it says... He opened the second seal. I heard the second living creature say, come. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it take, to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. All right. This is traditionally, as I said, um, the, uh, looked at as the time of great time of persecution that started um, after the first century. Um, and I'm not contradicting that at all. I would like to dig into the beauty of what this also shows. So a red horse still represents Christ because Christ's blood that covers and sacrifices, but his sacrifice for us. It also is an image of the martyrs because the martyr's blood is a picture or a lesser light of Christ's sacrifice, right? If we follow the Lamb, even unto death, even to be martyred for Him, then we are reflecting Him in that. And so, the, you know, this imagery of the red. 
But I want to look at the verse in Matthew 10, 34, because Matthew, uh, in Matthew 10, 34, Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So sometimes we think, oh, you know, the first one like relates to Jesus, the second one, you know, not so much, right? No, it still is. Jesus is still opening it. He still is the one who comes not to bring peace, but a sword. He said it himself. He said that people will turn against one another, right? He taught this. And that sword that is used in here, that word sword actually means a dagger. That dagger is used for sacrifice. It's a sacrificial dagger. So what Jesus is saying is that what I'm what I'm teaching isn't going to bring peace right now. The gospel of peace, the prince of peace isn't going to rule until he comes back and comes a second time. What he says is going to happen is there's going to be division because of it. And he gives this imagery that we will be persecuted right? And this is what we're seeing. And this also has continued. It didn't wait until Pentecost, right? John was martyred. Um, John the Baptist was martyred before Pentecost. So this, um, this sword has been ongoing throughout, the, throughout time and continues to go throughout time. But the good news is that this is still a representation of Jesus. And it is to associate himself with those who are persecuted. If you are being persecuted, know that Jesus understands that. He understands what it means to be the sacrificial lamb. He's the one opening the seal. So it's actually a lot of encouragement that's happening. And this goes out, this horse goes out to the earth. All right, so then we come to the third horse. Third horse, third seal. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures. Remember I told you, four living creatures in the midst of the throne, voices and thunderings from the throne. It says, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. And usually they, um, this is tied historically to um, the, the start of the Dark Ages um, when the, the church came into power and started to um, sort of suppress light by overlaying it with tradition and um, also, you know, times of famine. That's tradition. Like I said, I'm just adding to it. So what I love about this black horse is, is a few things. First of all, black, it does mean, um, if you look it up in the, from the Hebrew word in the Greek, it just means black. Um, in the Hebrew, this, the word used for that means dusky. It means um, the dawn before the sun rises. It, it, it means dim. There's not enough light in it, right? And so this is, we get a picture of, sort of a famine of God's word, so to speak, a famine of the light of his truth. And the scales, we also get a picture of judgment. And it, it can bring us back to Daniel chapter 5, verse 27, where, um, if you know that story, we call it the writing on the wall, and a hand came and wrote on the wall. And um, it says that one of the words meant you've been weighed and found wanting. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. In fact, you know, today scales are still used for justice. Weighed in the balance and found wanting. So, so what's happening is we see there may be a darkness of light, um, you know, darkness, a lack of light going on. But what's going out through the world is one that weighs one that weighs and judges and checks. And there's this beautiful picture that also comes out of it. First, starting back with the word black, that word dusky, that word, it's used to describe the bride of Solomon in the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is about God's love for his people. And the bride is dark but lovely. And this is such such a beautiful picture for us because it's saying 
you know, like a picture of God's love. We don't always get it right. We live in dimness, but we are lovely to him. We are beautiful to him so much so that, you know, he is charging out to, to save us and to provide. And in this horse, we actually see images of provision for us in the time of dim dimness and time of darkness. And that is when it says a quart of wheat for a denarius. A denarius was a day's wage. A quart of wheat was enough food for one person for one day. Then it says three quarts of barley for a denarius. That would be enough food of lesser quality food, considered lesser quality, but to feed a small family. So basically what this is saying, when we say the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, God is saying for every day that you seek, for that day provision is made. For you seek him personally, what you need will be provided. It may be a dark world, but you will never go hungry spiritually. This is good news. Oh my goodness, don't you just see, if we just count this as something that happened historically and we don't open our hearts to learn more from it, we would miss this great encouragement, no matter how dark the world is. When we invest one day in seeking the Lord, seek Him first, right? And all these things shall be added to you. Seek Him first. He will give us our daily bread. Such good news. So that's the wheat for one person. What about the barley? There's only a handful of times that barley is mentioned in the New Testament here and also at the feeding of the thousands. So when the, the loaves and the fish were brought to Jesus, those were barley loaves. And so the other picture that we get here is not only will you have food for the day, but if you seek God, you can have enough food to share. You can have enough food to share his grace with others. Isn't this gorgeous? I love this. It's encouraging. It shouldn't be a thing of fear. In this darkness, God has provision for us. So, and then it goes on, do not harm the oil and the wine, which are these great imageries of, of deep spiritual blessing, the oil of the Holy Spirit, deep connectivity to God, and the wine, the image of the blood of Jesus um, as we celebrate, you know, communion, that his blood that's shed for us, and also an image of um, the wine, which is used as an image of doctrine of truth of what we teach. So it. It, th these won't be harmed. We will still have them if we're seeking them, if we're seeking them daily. So beautiful, beautiful picture there. The other thing I'd like to share here is that these seals mimic sort of an idea of the plagues of, that happened and fell on Egypt. Now the first three plagues fell on everybody, including Israel. And that ties us back to what we talked about in Deuteronomy, the blessings and the curses. All have fallen, all have sinned and fallen short, short. All of us have to have some form of correction at some time. God gives us these corrections to guide us back to him. So we feel the pains of this world, but we feel them less. We feel them less because the plague of darkness that landed on Egypt in Goshen, where the Israelites were, they still had light. So what this is saying, basically, there is darkness, but there's still food for you. There's still, for those seeking God, there is provision. So this is just really a very beautiful way to um, look at the seals. Okay, and then number four, and I'm obviously going to go quite a bit faster on chapter seven. We may have to revisit it, but there's just so much good news in here. I can't handle it. All right. So number four, the pale horse, right? It's four seal. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on the horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him and power was given over them for a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. So you see the, the covenantal cor correction happening in there, right? But here's the thing about the fourth horse. That color is ashen. It is the color of death of somebody who has died. Um, but the good news is this. 
remember back in Revelation 1.18, Jesus is holding the keys to death in Hades. So this horse as well is under his control. He's the one opening them all. So each one of these horses actually represents a different power of Jesus. And, it's, and we should see in him uh, our protection and the grace and the comfort and the presence. Now this horse brings with it death covenantal curses for those who are not, um, not hearing, not following. Before I move on from the four horses, the first four seals, I want to note this. Each one starts with come. Now, when we read that, we can interpret it different ways. And like I said, God's word is expansive. I think he wants us to see things different ways. But um, each one says come. And that means come. It can mean to John, come. As some interpret it, come and see, as if they're calling John over to come and see, right? But it can also just be their voice as they send out the horse saying to everyone, come. You see the purpose of these horses, every single one of them, is to turn our hearts to God, to come, to come to worship, to come find Jesus, to come to salvation, to come. And so this is also a little bit of foreshadowing because at the end of Revelation, it says the spirit and the bride both say, come, right? Come. So, all right. I love that. All right. Now we get into the fifth seal and you're probably thinking, Sandy, now how are you going to get through the rest of this in any kind of decent time? I think a lot of the rest of it isn't as hard to grasp something out of personally. And I can circle back if you have specific questions. But the fifth seal, we see the martyrs crying out, and they're saying, how long? Now, if we were to go back to Zechariah chapter 1, right after the, the horses were seen, you would see Zechariah saying, how long? That question comes up, how long? But the greatest tie for this section is found in Genesis 4.10, which says the blood of, Cain, the blood of Abel cries out to God. Cain killed his brother. Right? I hope I'm getting the names right. I'm getting names messed up. But the blood cried out to God. And so this is this imagery. These are souls that have been martyred, but God does not forget their cry for justice and for salvation and for how long do they have to wait for it. And so the fifth seal is pure encouragement for anything that we suffer, for the losses that we suffer, for those that we know rest in, in God, how long? We should receive this as comfort that God hears. In fact, he dedicates a whole seal to reminding us that he hears those voices. And he says, wait, just wait, it's coming, it's coming. All right, and then we go on to um, the sixth seal. Now the sixth seal has a lot of things that happen um, that, are, are, that are visible. And the way that it's worded um, it seems like actual natural happening. So when you look historically at how we understand this, this is what happened, things that happened in the seven, late 17th, early 18th century. People actually saw and felt and experienced these things. The great Lisbon earthquake, um, the sun became black, the great dark day, um, huge uh, meteor showers that the stars fell. So this is one of the things that caused the great awakening at that time that was interdenominational and international people saw this happen they started looking and saying here we are in prophecy which means we're getting very close to the coming of christ all right so and and i do believe that i also believe these things keep going in fact i looked at a blood red moon last night you know <laughs> i watched the falling stars over me so these things still, these signs are still present for us to see and to think of his coming soon. All right, and then it asks this question in verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? And all of chapter 7 is answering that question. This happens a lot through Revelation. We'll see it happening where, um, not only where, one thing is said, I, I heard this and I turned and saw that, but also we see this going on um, in the world, things happening, 
things falling on, you know, in this part we've seen on all people, but in some ways, especially on those who don't follow God. And then what happens is you turn and you see what's happening with God's people. So there's sort of this what they're doing and then the battle scenes it's sort of like that so the answer who can stand revelation chapter 7 those who are sealed and we see this picture of this holding back of anything worse happening all people are sealed until god's people are fully protected right um <laughs> for a minute i wish you could get as excited as me <laughs> I can't help it. I just love God's word. I get so excited by it. All right. So we see this protection and this call to the, the um, make sure that everyone gets sealed in their forehead. That is foreshadowing because we will see the false, um, false God sealing on the hand and the forehead. So the separation of the false and true. This is the start of it, the sealing. God is saying this is going to happen. This ties, of course, to Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. You can look at how we are sealed by the Spirit. So the sealing that happens to us. And then it says, I heard those who were sealed. And you have this count off, 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from that tribe. And it goes on 12 times 12,000, 144,000, right? So some people get caught up in that there will only be this elite 144,000, but it really doesn't work because remember we saw, we heard the line of the tribe of Judah and we saw the Lamb of God. Now we hear the naming of the 144,000 and in verse nine, it says, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, these are the saved of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and clothed with white robes, with palm branches, singing about God's salvation. So this is a picture of a saved, of all people saved. Um, it's sort of fast forward to a look and a glimpse at the end. So we have visions of worship. We have visions of, of never suffering anymore. And it comes to um, verse 17 where it says, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes, which is a preview to the end of Revelation where he will actually wipe all tears from our eyes. So this is another thing that Revelation does. It sort of gives us a picture and then it sort of fast forwards in that section and then it goes back. So we fast forwarded to the end and then it goes backwards and it starts building a bigger picture. It may show a glimpse of the end, goes backwards, builds a better, bigger picture until it gets to the actual end. So, so this is what we see going on here and such awesome news. Uziel, I'm glad that you checked in today. Hi, it's good to see you online. Just forgive me if I didn't pronounce that right. Um, anyway, I hope you guys are excited by this. I want to wrap up with this thought. That is to remember Revelation 1.17. Jesus started this all off by saying, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. We don't have to fear the end times. We don't have to fear. We just need to keep our eyes on him and who's in control and what's happening and all his great provisions for us because he is a good God. And his goal is not to, to judge and kill and slaughter. His goal is to say, come to find salvation in him. It, this is his heart. It, his word says it's his will that not one should be lost, but all should come to the knowledge of him. All should be saved. So all of this is about his desire to save us. And then to remember that there is so much truth and comfort here. He is the one that says, be patient. If you're suffering, the darkness of this world is hard. Be encouraged that I have the food you need. If you're hurting, if you're grieving, if you're asking how long, be encouraged. I hear you. I see you. I know the loved ones that you miss. I miss them as you do. I still hear their voices. God gives us all this love. He says, be encouraged because I have the victory in the crown. I am the one. Who ha who's in control of the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. 
I hear the cries and I have a robe of victory for you. So all we have to do is come. That's all we have to do, come. So such great news in this section. Next week, we will move on. Again, if you have any questions, anything I didn't cover deep enough, um, feel free to put them in the chat. I will address them and circle back to them. And um, yeah, I just, I just hope that this really encouraged you and opened your heart and mind. Like I said, I will put the link to the historic teachings because I am not diminishing them. I am adding to them. It's very important to keep in mind. All right, Kevin, uh, your talks and teachings help remove a lot of my fear and anger. Um, amen. I'm so glad, Kevin. That's, that's what the effect that it should have. That's the effect that studying Revelation absolutely should have on us because it creates us to be more in his image. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the good news of your word. Even when it looks like bad news, you have so much good news for us because you are a good father, a good savior, a good Lord. And this is why in chapter seven, it all circles back to worshiping you, praising you for your salvation, for your provision, for your grace, for your comfort, for your constant presence. And we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We welcome you into our heart and our life. And we pray that you keep us humble as we come before your word, that we can always be encouraged with um, new thoughts and insights to comfort our hearts and souls in the times that we live in. So bless everybody throughout this week, Lord, and watch over us, keep us safe until we come back together again to study next week. In your name, Jesus, I pray, amen. All right, everybody. Um, Nancy, I'm glad that you're enjoying the study as well. I invite you to join us online at 11 o'clock. We have a special guest speaker at Sunnyvale today. It is um, Pastor Dan Stearns. He is the new conference president for Central California Conference. So we are so thankful to have him here today. Um, we are so thankful and blessed to have his daughter, Danessa Stearns, who leads worship for us. So um, what, a, what a special thing to have a uh, father and, and daughter here today uh, leading worship. So we're looking forward to, to hearing from him. So I hope that you will join in and we'll see you online. All right, everybody, take care. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week. God bless. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I won't see you next week. I will be gone next week. I will have one week off. We will meet again in two weeks. I'm so glad I just remembered that. Two weeks, we will meet again. All right, take care. God bless, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.